Welcome to the home of 100 to 1 Faith TV. I'm Larry Gent, and this is the message for Grace Hartwood United Methodist Church on May 15th, The Road to Nowhere. Join me in the call to worship. God of comfort and compassion, you lead us to the water of life and table of your bounty. May the tender love of our good shepherd fill us with grace to care for your flock. Amen. Our reading today is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our Old Testament reading is from 2 Kings 6. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. Our New Testament reading is from Luke 24. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other as you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who doesn't know about these things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astonished us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and said they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those that were there with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. 
So he went in to stay with them. While he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Today, Emmaus is a mystery. We know where it was. The scripture says it was within seven miles of the city of Jerusalem. Well, we know where Jerusalem is. We can draw a seven-mile circle around the city, and we know Emmaus has to be there somewhere. But try as they might, archaeologists have never discovered it. It's not for want of exploring, Israel is one of the most explored and analyzed pieces of God's good earth. The problem is that it is also one of the most populated and historic places on earth. Many cities in the Holy Land have been built and rebuilt on top of old cities. Here in America, we have thousands of ceremonial mounds built by ancient native peoples. In the Near East, they have mounds too, but most of them are not ceremonial. They're cities built on top of ancient ruins, then destroyed by invading armies, then rebuilt on the ruins of the previous civilization. That process creates modern cities built over layers of history until the foundations of the city become hills. In Hebrew, the mounds that have grown up are called tells. You can see them all over the Holy Land. Tel Aviv, the first capital of Israel, is the best known of these cities. Others include Tel Megiddo, Tel Hazor, Tel Beersheba. By the time of Jesus, these cities had already been built and rebuilt dozens of times. In the 21st century, those biblical times have been buried by 2,000 years of construction projects. Under one of those mounds lies the memory of Emmaus, but we may never know where. So today, if you set off on the road to Emmaus, you would literally be on the road to nowhere. Now, these disciples knew where the city was. They knew where they were going. They knew where they would stay. They knew they'd get a good home-cooked meal there when they arrived. But they were still on the road to nowhere as they trudged along. They'd just been through one of the most dramatic events in human history. It's always difficult to lose a dear friend, but they watched their Savior, accused of false charges, publicly humiliated, stripped, beaten nearly to death, and nailed to a tree to die. They can well be forgiven for being stunned, dazed, and confused. How could they make sense of their world? How could they process all of that heartbreak and horror? Their world had been turned inside out and upside down. They felt powerless and pitiful. They were walking along with no real goal in sight. But they did a couple of things right. First, they didn't go it alone. No matter what you face today, that's still good advice. That's why God made this family we call the church. So you never have to walk alone. These disciples didn't go alone either. They got together and took a long walk. And as they walked, they talked about Jesus. 
That's always a good idea too. When people talk about Jesus, good things happen because the promise of Christ is still in force today. Wherever, whenever, two or three gather together and talk about Jesus, Christ is there with them. The disciples were walking with Jesus, but they didn't even notice. They were so full of grief and heartache, they couldn't see anything else. It was so clear that it was the first thing Jesus said to them. Hey, why the sad faces, y'all? With that invitation, the disciples began to tell Jesus what was going on. And Jesus let them ramble. Really? No, seriously. Well, tell me more. They told Jesus everything they were thinking and feeling, wondering and doubting. Those are all good things. When they arrived at the destination of their journey to nowhere, they made the best decision of their lives. They invited Jesus to come on in. And in the act of breaking bread, they finally knew him. Now, this wasn't a sacramental meal. It was just a simple supper. But they brought Jesus into the midst of it, and that was enough. Even though they couldn't see him anymore, they knew he was there. They knew he was risen. They knew he was Lord. They knew he was with them. So when they got up from that table, they knew where they were going. They never had to walk a pointless road to nowhere again. They walked with Jesus from that day forward. I think we've got a lot in common with the disciples on that Emmaus Road today. Our worlds have been turned inside out and upside down. We've lost loved ones. Some of the best and brightest have been laid low by a strange and unknown virus. Many of us feel powerless and pitiful with no clear goal in sight. We're on a road to nowhere but there are still a few things we can do right. First, we don't have to walk alone. We've just been through two years of isolation and it has taken a toll on every single one of us. But God has provided ways for us to walk together that didn't exist a few years ago. I don't know whether God inspired cell phones and Zoom but I do know that God can use them to bring us together. Do any of you remember the 20th century? Remember when our telephones belonged to the phone company and they were bolted onto the wall? You know, back then, everything stopped if you got a long distance phone call. Okay, okay, quiet down everyone. This is a long distance phone call. And a call from a loved one overseas? Everyone tried to gather around that phone and shout greetings as fast as possible because everybody knew no one could afford that for more than a minute or two. Now, there's no such thing as long distance. We can talk to anyone we want, anytime we like. More than that, We can even see each other. Most of us have a TV station right in our pockets. The technology has grown so fast, we don't even know how to use it all. But I do know this, we can walk together in more ways than ever, and that's always a good thing. Whenever we get together, we have the option of talking about the good news or the bad news. It seems like there is so much bad news to go around, at times it overshadows the good news. His friends were walking along with Jesus, the risen Savior, physically present, spiritually powerful, visible and victorious. That's pretty good news, isn't it? They were walking with Jesus, but they didn't even notice. They were too busy talking about 
the bad news of the day. Well, thank God that only happens to disciples like them. We never get caught overlooking Jesus while we talk about the day's bad news, would we? Uh, Jesus still asks us the same question on our roads to Emmaus. Hey, why the long faces, y'all? What are you so sad about? Then we proceed to do exactly what those disciples did. We presume to tell Jesus what's really going on. We tell God how hard this is, how worried we feel, how helpless we feel. Don't feel bad about doing that. It's a good thing to carry your worries to Jesus. He's the only one who can really do anything about them. But as you talk together, take time to notice. You are not alone. Whenever two or three of us get together and talk about these things, Jesus is here in our midst. They finally noticed him in the breaking of the bread. For Christians, this reminds us of Holy Communion. And this passage makes a great communion sermon, but here's the thing. They weren't having a sacramental meal. They were having just an ordinary supper. That ordinary meal became extraordinary because they invited Jesus to the table. And it turns out that every meal is sacred when we invite Jesus to the table. You know, that might be just the beginning. It might be that nothing we do is ordinary when we invite Jesus to do it with us. Everything we do is sacred when he walks with us. And if you turn away from your, your worries, if you turn your eyes upon Jesus, then the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. In fact, right now, if you just let go of your worries and care for a moment right now, if you look for Jesus as we've gathered here for this extraordinary moment, you just might see his face. And once you recognize him there, then nothing will be ordinary ever again.